Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. And sort of a priming the pump offer for you to give you a, an incentive. We'll make a deal for you. I've got a booklet entitled Revealing the Man of Sin. I've got another one called The Greatest Discovery of Our Age. You can't get either one of them anywhere. Let me put it this way. The truths in these books are not obtainable anywhere but right here. And if you send an offering and request one or the other, we'll send them to you, one or the other. Revealing the Man of Sin or Greatest Discovery of Our Age. Our address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. Send support to Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. If you want to continue to receive truths from these broadcasts, you hear nowhere else. It is time for Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. All around the world, from the United States to Canada, Europe, Russia, South Africa, Australia, the Holy Spirit is stirring the hearts of godly Christians. The Bible says, quote, as an eagle stirreth up his nest, end quote. We invite you to stay tuned as Pastor Peter J. Peters shines the mighty light of the gospel on the source of our problems and the only solution. Please keep Scriptures for America in your prayers. And now, Pastor Peters. And greetings to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In this radio broadcast, we're going to be talking about something that should have been talked about from the pulpits of the land a long time ago. The castration of the American male or the effeminization of the American male. I often sometimes like to throw out a question to the Judeo-Christian church world that has become so effeminized and has driven away real men that could be real men of God if they only understood true Christianity. I say to them, how many stones did it take for David to bring down Goliath? And, of course, the answer normally that is given is two stones. But the truth of the matter is it took three stones. One stone in the slingshot and two stones in the scrotum. Interestingly enough, the same word in the Hebrew refers to each one. Christ's kingdom is the stone kingdom. And the Bible teaches us that when... In the times of times past, when it came to the old temple, that those that were lacking one or two stones, were or testicles, if you will, were not allowed in the old temple. Well, it's translated stone, and it's the same word. Take a look around at our young men today. What has happened to them? They've been effeminized. And part of that effeminization process has happened through the communist plan called public school systems. Yes, that's one of the planks, major planks, of the communist manifesto. And it was a woman that promoted the public school system. In this message, you're going to hear a friend of mine, Pastor Earl Jones, speak about the effeminized male. And he takes his message from an old, old book written in the 30s, if I remember right, by an old school teacher that could see what was happening. Now we have also a tape called Babylonian Castration. It's a message that I delivered years ago at the same conference that Pastor Jones brought this message at. And if you'd like to have that cassette tape message, send us an offering and request it, and we'll send it to you. Our mailing address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535 USA. We'll be giving that address again, but let's get to the message by Pastor Earl Jones entitled The Effeminized Male. I think you'll enjoy it. Admonitions. This is not an admonition, it's a lesson. And I think it's a lesson that we need to understand and need to understand from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, I'm not chastising anybody. I want you to leave here a little bit more knowledgeable than you came with the information that I have to give you. 
thy kingdom come on earth that is as it is in heaven. Thy will be done, O Yahweh God. We can rearrange it that way, you know. And what is it that we're talking about? We're talking about a kingdom message. We're not talking personal salvation here. We're talking about a kingdom message. National salvation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What, um, what did he say here? He said is that it is at hand. That means that all we have to do is reach out and take it. It's there. I want to give you the kingdom. So <clears throat> that too is a national message. It's not personal salvation. Now, when we have national repentance, and we say it over and over again in Second Chronicles seven fourteen, he promises us that he we will he will heal our land. Again, that's a national repentance and a national healing. It's a national message. How do you get national message? How do you get a national repentance? If we have two hundred million Americans, we need to have a goodly share of those Americans give personal repentance and then they will become and then they will receive the national repentance and they will we will then receive the kingdom. Now it's as simple as that, but we're a long ways from it. Once upon a time we were a lot closer than we are now. But we've slipped backwards. And that's been the history of our people all the way from the beginning. We're backsliders and we're stiff necked. We know the answers. Consequently, we have to learn some things and we have to take some medicine, some pretty strong medicine at times, to chastise us from within, to make these corrections, admonitions, if you will. We in the identity movement <clears throat> have spoken often that everything good that ever happens in our nation first starts from behind the pulpit. And conversely, it is also said that everything bad that comes about in our nation of Israel again starts from behind the pulpit. We've also recognized that modern denominationalized Judeo-Christian churches have become totally feminized. That's true. There's no question about this. But that, by, by that I mean that the ministers are effeminate and they even look effeminate now. Most of them. Now I'm not, there are exceptions to this, but you see by and large the way they dress, the way they keep their body in shape, the tone of their body, their voice, the subject matter that they talk about and so forth. They have become effeminate. The church boards, either directly or indirectly through husbands, are controlled by women. That's a truism. I don't like to say it, but it's true. The ministers are directed to preach sermons that are satisfactory to the ladies or they are replaced. By far the largest number of members of the church are women. This again is true. You just go look on the rosters. You go look at the Sunday attendance. You will find this is the case. <coughs> we know that the sermons that are preached in the average Judeo-Christian church are today limited to the personal salvation aspects of the Word of God. Now, we know that that's important. It's extremely important, particularly to each of us as individuals. But what about the national message? Isn't it a little selfish to be so totally concerned <clears throat> about our personal salvation <clears throat> and not want to become involved in the national uh, salvation aspects? I believe the phrase that is so commonly said by the modern churchgoer is, it is just between me and God. This is the way it is. More and more husbands and sons are going fishing or hunting <coughs> on Sunday. They want nothing to do with it. That's true. Because the men of this nation have turned from God's word and they have tried to find something else 
to replace it, something else to improve matters, they have joined either the Masons or the service clubs. The end result is a nation that is trying to improve itself in the name of man instead of in the name of God. It is simply called secular humanism. What I would like to talk about today is why, in my opinion, these men and boys refuse to go to church. Why don't they want to be around these ministers? And for that matter, why don't they want to be around the men that go to that church? Why can't they accept the messages that these ministers give? There has to be a reason for this. I think we can define it. But as you will very soon see, this subject could never, never be talked about in the average modern denominational church. If most of the ministers, even today, even hinted that they wanted to talk about this subject, they would be summarily replaced by the church. And that's a fact. Now, I'm speaking to an identity group. Some of you are old timers. I know some of you here, your faces for many, many years. Some of you are new at the, at the identity message. But I'm not talking, I'm not speaking to you people. It's not the average identity movement that uh, we're speaking with. There are exceptions to this. There are people, even newcomers particularly, within the identity movement that don't, still don't quite understand this. I am very proud to be able to say that what I'm going to talk about does not generally involve you people. I'm giving this message so that you, as individuals, will understand it and in turn then go out and teach it to your brothers and sisters. Teach it to your neighbors, your friends, and other people, wherever you can get them to listen. This is one of our major problems in Israel today. We in the Denny movement have a completely different understanding of the Word of God. It's almost as though we just turn the thing upside down and we look at it in a completely different sense. The personal salvation aspects versus the national salvation aspects, things of this nature. <clears throat> Men are attracted to the identity movement as a result of this. And as I look out over the, face, uh, over the faces here today, uh, we're sprinkled with the proper proportions, uh, men and women, and this is wonderful. Our, under, our ladies understand what the messages that we're trying to give are and what they mean, and we love and, re love and respect you for it. So I'm not speaking to you ladies here today necessarily. So please understand that I'm not directing this message to you. I'm teaching you so that you can go out and teach others. But incidentally, though, if there are any of you here who have just a little twinge of this thought in you, uh, take it to heart. It's an admonition. I want you to understand so you can teach others. The title of my message today is The Feminized Male. Now, you might say, well, gosh, why are the ladies going to get upset about this? Well, you'll find out in just a little bit. But the title is The Feminized Male. The title itself will tell you why this message could never be given in the average Judeo-Christian church. Most men would go to the minister and accuse him of calling him a sissy. And most of the women would go to the minister and call him a chauvinist. And they would be for two separate and opposite reasons. But that's what happens. Now, to tell you the truth, I'm a little uneasy about this myself right now. Uh, I saw to it that there weren't any tomatoes or any eggs out there. <laughs> so I already took care of that. But it, it, is, uh, it is a hard subject to give. And so please bear with me and please keep on loving me. I gave a command, companion sermon once to this. It was titled Men's Responsibilities to God. And I was <clears throat> working entirely out of the Bible. And I was trying to show our men folks what their responsibility was in leading their families and their nation into the kingdom. And I was directing it to the men. And I was chastising the men just terribly. And uh, sure enough, there was a young modern American woman stood up after the, after the message and she said it sounds like male chauvinism to me. 
And it's kind of like uh, when you start talking about identity and so forth, it says sounds like white supremacy. So it's the same, it's the same mentality that, that we're talking about here, and that's what she did. And uh, it's, uh, it's funny that uh, this young woman is a, very much a product of modern America. And her husband, he's a feminized male. He doesn't know it, and if you told him that he was a feminized male, he wouldn't admit it, but he is. So please bear with me. We're going to learn some things here now that perhaps hasn't been discussed much. I'm going to be extracting my information somewhat from a book. It's by the same title, Feminized Male. It was written by a woman school teacher, an old-timer at the business. She's very well known in her studies of this phenomenon. Now, if we put two thoughts together, that everything good or bad that happens to our country starts from behind the pulpit, thought one, and that our churches are teaching and working from the woman's point of view, thought two, we should be able to understand another very important lesson. Turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 3. I know that you've all read this before, you've thought a lot about it, but I want to give the information here from somewhat of a different perspective, and it fits right into the message that we're talking about. Let's read, starting in verse 1, For behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay of the staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. Therein Verse 4, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes will rule over them. I recognized that for the first time when Sheldon Emery used to, as you remember, go to Washington every year, and I had the honor of going with him several times. And first time I went, <clears throat> it didn't take, gee, 30 minutes in the Longworth building until I really saw the basis of the problem of America. You go in there, number one, and the offices look somewhat like mine. They're just all topsy-turvy, and there's desks on top of desks. But uh, the first thing that happened was that <clears throat> young people, just almost high school age, the, a young lady, maybe 19, 20, 21, would be the, uh, the receptionist and would be also the, uh, the one who took his, uh, his uh, appointments, his appointment secretary. And uh, here was this young girl that was really basically making the decision as to whether or not you were going to see the legislator or whether you're going to see a lesser hireling down the line. And she made that decision. Well, you're going to see him at all. And here she was, not even dry behind the ears yet, and she couldn't, she couldn't have made a decent decision. And then if uh, she made the decision that you were not going to see the congressman or the senator, uh, then she also then made the decision who you would see. And so invariably out would come another person who didn't have sufficient experience and uh, here would be the chief of staff or uh, a writer or a, a staff person who wrote his position papers on this tremendous point or that tremendous point and then the representative or the the congressman or the or the senator would then go forth to and make his vote yay or nay based on the staff work that was done by uh, these young whiz kids and you could see exactly who was running America today uh, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. All right, now j drop on down, if you would, to verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Now, you see that tremendously in Washington also. The same situation applies that I just described. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Then drop on down to 16. Moreover the Lord saith, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk 
with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Now, I want you to understand, as you read these verses here with me, I want you to think about the modern generation of Americans, where we have come, what we are doing, what is important in our lives. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and the nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins. That's curling irons. And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle they rent, and instead of well-set hair baldness, and instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty in the war. And in her gates shall lament, lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Now read verse four, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now that <clears throat> reminds me of Zsa, Zsa Gabor. The only thing is in reverse. She's had seven or eight husbands instead of seven or eight women to one man, but it's the same concept. Zsa, Zsa Gabor epitomizes this, as does Jane of Fonda. And <clears throat> yet we eulogize Jane Fonda, we eulogize Jaja Gabor, and you get the message. I, uh, Mary Alice and I, several years ago, was listening to a young lady uh, from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she, she was telling us that, <clears throat> that uh, in the end times, you know, uh, women are going to bring the country to fall. It is going to be the women's fault. And it is they who will cause it to fail. And I, I didn't... I didn't want to discuss the matter with her because that is kind of a particular subject. And I didn't want to discuss it with her. And I thought about that for some long time. And consequently, uh, when uh, I really started putting this together, I went back to the thoughts that she gave. And, of course, she was reading directly out of Isaiah here in her mind as she said this. And, of course, her ministers and so forth apparently taught her this point. So... <clears throat> What is this telling us? It is simply saying that when our nation is willing to accept the leadership of women to run the nation, God will bring us low. That's a promise by God. History. Go back in your secular history. Now, there's going to be exceptions to this, and I can quote you some exceptions. But history will also show that when a nation starts to decline and fall, the people are willing to install women as their leaders. This is not godly. And God says, I'm going to bring you low. Now, the one classic example of the exception to this is Queen, Queen Boadicea of, of England at the time of the Roman legions uh, uh, war on, on England. And, and the Roman legions never brought England to uh, the, her knees. But Queen Boadicea... Uh, was a great warrior and she's a gal that's on the, the coins of England and that statue uh, she's, uh, she's the gal that could pro perhaps be considered one of the exceptions uh, there are exceptions and, uh, but by the main this does not, uh, is, not, uh, is not true now <clears throat> don't think for a minute either that what uh, we're talking about what has happened in our country is by accident it wasn't their women folk that created this situation. It's not their fault. It's a situation that has taken place and it has culminated in its current affairs in, to such a degree that the nation is now paying the price. Our enemies understand this. Uh, they understand the Bible and its precepts better than most of us do. They study the details of the uh, Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, better than we do generally. Now, the recent example, the one that is on us right now, 
that is the perfect example of what I'm trying to say is the whole concept of women working. I remember in my lifetime, I'm old but I'm not that old, in my lifetime, the short lifetime that I have had, I have seen with my own eyes the change take place. At first, after the war, of course, Rosa the Riveter came back and she, she was needed in the war and this was a wonderful thing and it, and it worked out fine. But she came back and she saw and was told over and over again on the radio and on the TV when it came into, into being that all you need to do is go down and work one day, two days a week, maybe even just an afternoon or whatever, and you can buy yourself a new sofa or new clothes. You can do something just for you, and won't that be nice? You won't take from the family funds whatsoever. Your husband's earning will still feed the family, pay the bills, etc., and he will be the man of the house, but you will just have some extra nice money with which to, uh, with which to spend. Well, we bought it, hook, line, and sinkers. And what had happened was that we men allowed that to happen. We saw that our wives wanted these things, and so they went out and worked just one af afternoon a week or two afternoons a week or whatever. So it wasn't very long. Now, if you older folks will remember, and all of a sudden, those women started working five days a week. And then all of a sudden, the prices went to match both salaries and now all of a sudden it is such that our young people today are locked into the wall both the wife and the husband have to work in order to even barely feed the family so now how did that happen boy they sucked us in just those wonderful messages on TV and the wonderful messages on radio and what you read in the ladies home journal and so forth and so on they sucked us in and so consequently, you can't blame our women folks for this. It is we, the men, who allowed it to happen. And we, the women, men, must take it right square on the nose. Now, <clears throat> let's find out what that woman school teacher found out and wrote in her book, The Feminized Male. Her writings came about after years of exhaustive studies and batteries of tests, both at... Uh, uh, in all kinds of prestigious uh, universities and organizations such as the National Health Service and some of the leading colleges and universities on the subject. The book came to me through a, from a used bookstore after it had been discarded from a high school library. Now, that in itself, if you really think about that, tells you a story. Why did the book even, was it even discarded? Because no one was reading it. No one cared about this. It's a taboo subject. And so consequently, it was discarded. It went to used bookstore, and I bought it. It's that kind of thing that we are living with. In this book, this lady says this, that murders are usually committed by quiet and gentle men, nice guys, by the feminized male whose normal male impulses are suppressed or misshapen by overexposure overexpo to feminine norms. Isn't that something? That, that's a pretty big statement that this lady made. And yet, she did so after a tremendous amount of study. Murders by people who suppress their aggressive instinct outnumber murders by persons who show aggression by more than three to one. Now, that's an amazing thing. We always think of the, of the murderer, the one who, who murders... Uh, being somewhat of this tough, uh, hair on his chest, uh, burly type of guy and so forth. This is not true. It's by the feminized male, three to one, that does the murder. Now, she's talking about murders as compared to the killings of war and as two distinct separate things. Male suicides greatly outnumber female suicides. About 70% of all successful suicides are male. It's amazing. It's almost three out of four. <laughs> Women, however, by the like number, make up 70% of the unsuccessful attempts at suicide. And she claims that many of them weren't intended in the first place. In mental institutions for children, boys outnumber girls three to one 
in mental institutions. We're talking about serious problems now. How did it get this way? If boys are more, not more disturbed than girls, at least they're more disturbing. And thus, they are more likely to be put away. Boys are also more likely to be labeled as mentally retarded, simply sometimes because they act up more than girls do. Now, these are findings as based on her extensive studies through these various organ from these various organizations. Boy delinquents outnumber girls five to one, a ratio she says has held that way for many, many years. Gangs of boys are about 300 times as common as that of girls. Boys are a problem in the schools as well as on the streets. We know this. Control and discipline in the school usually means to the establishment, how do we tame the boys and get them to sit down and be quiet? Now we're talking about problems. And we're talking about how we have feminized males. We're going to find out. Because boys are regarded as problems, teachers are more likely to fail them. That's a fact. I have three boys, and I remember Mary Alice and I having many sittings with the boys as well as their teachers and the principals regarding uh, this sort of thing. They were generally well-behaved young men, uh, but you could see they, that boys just created more problems. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to a message by Pastor Earl Jones entitled The Effeminized Male. We're going to get back to that message in just a moment, but I want to tell you that if you'd like to have the entire message, you can write to us and request it by name. That's The Effeminized Male. And enclose an offering of $5 or more for that tape. Also, if you'd like to have a, an accompanying tape with it entitled Babylonian Castration by, by, by myself, uh, and request it by name as well and close a $5 offering. And you'll notice that this message was delivered several years ago. Things have gotten a lot worse since then. He's quoting from a book that was written in the 30s, and that's before they had Ritalin and other drugs to give our children. And things have gotten worse since that time. So I want to keep that in mind. And also you'll notice that he's used the word identity. Well, that's before the word was demonized. If you'd like to have our treatise entitled, We're Not Gay, We're Not Cannibals, and We Certainly Are Not Identity, we'll send that to you free of charge. You see, the people that have discovered who the true Israel people are, the twelve tribes dispersed abroad that James spoke of, being the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, Celtic, and kindred people, those European people who came to America and formed America, the people that have discovered that are being attacked and demonized. And so one of the ways they do that is take a word and demonize that word. So if you'd like to have that treatise entitled, We're Not Cannibals, We're Not Gay, and We're Not Identity, we'll send that to you free of charge. If you want the two tapes, or one or the other tapes, the Feminized Male and Babylonian Castration, write and request them by name, close an offering of at least $5 for t per tape, and if you want that treatise, just write to us and we'll send it to you free of charge. Here's the mailing address, Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Again, that's Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. And remember, your contributions to this ministry allow us to get on other radio stations and stay on the one you're listening to. Now back to the message by Pastor Earl Jones. Well, <clears throat> there's probably a lot there. You see, the, the maturity just takes longer to get there. And uh, that's a normal factor of life. But some of these pathological conditions we have to question. In the genetic disorder dyslexia, where the dominant hand and the brain control are on the same side, either the right or left, Five times as many boy children are afflicted than girls. Boys are more likely to be stricken with speech problems. 
Now, these are tremendous things. Uh, we just don't think about them. But these are all facts of life that we're living in all around us today. Something is wrong. Now, on top of all of this, troubles caused by the social rules and sex standards, as well as these genetics that I just gave you, modern men lead a rougher life than women. Now, you listen to the women, that's not true, but I'm saying what this woman uh, reports as a result of her uh, batteries of, of examinations, tests, and statistical evidence. More is expected of them, and their emotional outlets are more limited. They must fight, not cry, tremble. They can't scream. They can't run. They must also stay cool in all situations, take care of themselves, keep their own counsel. Now, you know, I believe in every one of those. That's right. They should. And I think that boys should do just exactly that. They shouldn't go around slobbering all over everything. They're supposed to keep their own counsel. But you see, the point that she is making there is that you have these problems, and yet you want him to be a man when it comes to that. And when he doesn't, and he doesn't act like a man in those areas, you have compounded your problems on him all over again. He now is torn again, a torn apart again. All right, so Mrs. Patricia Sexton, who wrote this book, she is the author of the book, and she says that the institutions that teach the, teaches these boys, especially home and school. So you see, we have the problem both at home and at school. And this is the point that she is making. Do not help them to become men. But on the contrary, feminize them. Keeping them dependents and minors until they're practically middle age. There is a saying that goes around in men's circles something like this. When the boy gets married, he leaves his wife's apron strings and latches on, I mean, leaves his mother's apron strings and latches on to his wife's apron strings. Now, to me, this is sad, and it doesn't have to be that way. In Deuteronomy 4, in verses 8 and 9, it says this, And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from the heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. In Deuteronomy 19, you can read this starting in verse 18. Therefore shall ye lay up the, these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless between your eyes and ye shall teach them your children speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates the French say Chassez la femme. Look for a woman at the bottom of your troubles. It is also said that if we look even deeper, we will find a man. Our men folks simply have to accept their responsibilities. Responsibilities to God, country, and family. This is our problem. It's a national message. It's a national repentance. One of the biggest prayers that we should give daily is teach our men to be men. What are we looking for? Why do we have all these problems that I just described? Why are they there? There is not much we can do about the genetic problems. God in all of his infinite wisdom made it that way. Or was it that the way it was? Look at it another way. Could we be, be could we be punished? Are we being punished for what we're doing? Could it be that they say that the reason for it technically is that the male lacks a double X chromosome that that the woman has? Uh, why do we lack a double X chromosome? It doesn't exist in the in the animal kingdom. 
and it doesn't exist in the non-Israel kingdoms in the same sense. It is happening to our people. Could it be punishment from God Almighty? What about the pathological and the sociological conditions? Let me give you the first key. Boys who rise to the top in school more often resemble girls than boys. Now, in many, many of the important ways, this is true. You'll find exceptions to that, too. Even the big burly football player and making top A's. I mean, you see this. But generally speaking, the scholars are effeminate. Scholastic honor and masculinity too, too often do not go together. Now, does this surprise you? It really shouldn't. Think about it now. How does this happen? Here we are trying to get our boys to excel in school. And if we do that, they, we run a chance of them losing their masculinity. It doesn't have to be that way. But right now, that's the way it is. Our boys themselves know this. They do. They want to be men more than anything else. The school wants them to be scholars more than anything else. There's something wrong. We're doing something wrong, and we have got to change. Remember what I said about the men and the boys going fishing on Sunday rather than going to church, being around a feminine institution? Perhaps a lot of the men and the boys who are out fishing and hunting on Sunday are feminine themselves. Maybe they are, but they don't, they don't want... Maybe they even know they are, but they don't want to be that way. They are rebelling, and they are doing the only thing that they know how to do. Just don't go. Rebel up again, not only against that, but everything else that comes up. They can't talk about it, because the entire society is against talking about the feminized male. You think about it. It's never talked about it. Mrs. Sexton shows in her book, and you know this to be true now, all you've got to do is read the newspapers, that homosexuals, homosexuality is talked about just ad lib all the time, every day. It's thrown in our faces constantly, but not the feminized male. It's off limits. And she said this, and it's probably true, that she said that the conditions that presents the one problem in all probability forms the other one also. Both problems come from the same conditions in our society. So this is something for us to think about. What does it mean to be masculine anyway? Think about this. Masculinity stresses values such as courage, inner direction, forms of aggression, autonomy, mastery, technological skill, group solidarity, and keep that word foremost in your mind here now, group solidarity, adventure, and toughness of mind and body. These are all masculine traits. I want you to think about these values. You will find that the national message of the Bible stresses and requires most of those values. The national message of the Bible requires mostly masculine traits for its accomplishment. In other words, if we are to discuss the national message of the Bible and take its information forward and demand that our nation live in accordance with the national message, we must realize that these masculine traits are of prime importance. <coughs> We will talk more about this in just a few moments. Also note that the being masculine does not in any way include viciousness or wife or child abuse. That's not masculine. First, we have to find out how this phenomena of feminizing our males came about. In public elementary schools, and I'm going to put a plug in here now for homeschool. You can read it all through here. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get to that part of Pastor Jones's message of how it came about, 
I want to tell you that uh, you're listening to the Effeminized Mail, a message delivered by Pastor Jones quite some time ago. And if you'd like to have that message, we'd like to send it to you. It's available for an offering of at least $5 or more. Remember, your offerings keep us on the radio and keep our radio ministry expanding. If you'd like to have a parallel message with that called Babylonian Castration by yours truly, Pastor Peter J. Peters, request it as well and close an offering for it. Our mailing address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. That's Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. If you'd like our introductory packet, Enclose an additional $2 in your offering, and we'll send that to you as well. And there's far more material in there than the $2 that at least cover postage and handling. By the way, Pastor Earl Jones has had a newsletter for years called the Christian Intelligence Newsletter. And if you'd like to subscribe to it or get a sample copy, write to him. His address is, get this down, HC66, Box 39. Deming, New Mexico, 88030. Again, Pastor Earl Jones' address, if you'd like to get on his mailing list for his newsletter, Christian Intelligence Newsletter, is HC66, Box 39, Deming, New Mexico, 88030. And now, back to the message. Do it. In our public elementary schools... 85% of all teachers are women. Now at home, in homeschool, the wife, the mother, will do the majority of the teaching. But it's very closely associated with the husband because it is there together. They discuss it. And the husband has much more to say about what is being taught that child, how he is being taught, than if the child is out of his personal control. He has control of that family. He's supposed to have control of the family. He has legal control of that family. And he can do it at home, and he can't do it in the public schools. And really, that's the solution to the entire problem. Teach your kids at home. This is really the bottom line of what I'm talking about today. From nursery through graduate school, schools are feminine institutions. The way they go about it, the way it's handled, what they say, how they do the grading, what is proper, and so forth. In the school, women set the standards for behavior. This is a fact. And they will favor students, male and female, who conform to their own behavior standards. This is the way it is. The mother, the wife can understand the behavior sta standards a little bit better, particularly if the husband who was there saying, I want this young man to be masculine. And he has a lot of say-so about what represents the behavior standards. What are they in the woman's viewpoint? Polite, clean, obedient, neat, kind, moderate, tactful, well-mannered. Now, you know, there's not a bad thing there. They're good traits. Every one of those. You can have those traits and have the masculine traits at the same time. They're both Christian. But what is going wrong today is that these traits that I just now described to you are the ones that are being stressed that makes you a Christian. Those are the things that are being stressed for personal salvation. Those are the things that the women, from a woman's point of view, feel is the more important. From the man's point of view, he sees the masculine traits as the more important. That's the national message. To put it, to put just any man in that school as a teacher won't do either. It is the feminized man acting in the capacity of the coaches that creates much of the homosexual problems starting way back in school. This is a fact she brings out in her book. Now, the boys soon learn in the class 
doesn't take long to learn this either. If you want to be a good student, you want to make good grades, you do it the teacher's way. This is a simple fact of life. Don't be independent. Don't debate a point. How many times, how many times have you men uh, yesteryear uh, would debate the point with the teacher and get a bad grade? I did. Well, I did this even in college. I take physics twice and I understood physics because I debated a young graduate engineering, uh, graduate physics uh, teacher. Uh, he was hooking up a circuit wrong over there and he was blowing fuses and I told him, look, I just twist the thing around and do it that way and you won't blow the fuses. Well, I got a D for this and a D wouldn't count in engineering school and I had to take it over. So uh, this, this happens. Now, he was a feminized male, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> don't talk very much don't express your inner thoughts don't use boys language now, that doesn't mean curse words per se but just don't say it the way boys say it uh, some real good examples is uh, uh, some of the, the examples that Brother Pete gives in some of his sermons those, those are boys languages and they're, they're very masculine and they, those are things that, uh, that uh, the, 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 fe the feminized male don't understand those are the things that women don't understand those are things that personal salvation don't un doesn't understand in its, in its uh, usual uh, conceived sense and so don't do this it just simply means learn what it takes to be good grades. Now, you don't develop leaders that way. That's not the way you develop leaders in our society. And there is one of our problems. No leaders. It always amazes me to watch real boys grow up. They do all of these terrible things in school and the parents are down in this principal's office being chastised for this or that or the other thing and they look at the report card and they take it back to the school teacher and say, what can we do to improve the grades here and so forth and so on. And then all of a sudden it seems, gosh, I mean in two or three years, it seems that this young boy all of a sudden learns enough, just bang, just like that, to be a good engineer, to be a good lawyer, be a doctor, to be an electrician, whatever his calling is, he seems to learn it all in two or three years. Did you ever notice that? It just seems to be that way. And so we take this into account. Many boys fight becoming feminized by becoming intensely active in tough group sports. This is a trait. And here is the second key that we must know. It is also the point that I believe relates to why God sets up the rulership of nations the way he does. Here is a point that I'm going to make that I think will tell us why this happens. It certainly, God didn't do it certainly because we were better students or well, more well-mannered or better behaved. I mean, that's not the reason he set up the rules the way he did. Now, the examples in the Bible, Jesus, of course, was concerned about a centurion in the book of Matthew. And what was it that the centurion wanted? The centurion was concerned about his servant. It was group solidarity that that, sermon, that, that centurion was concerned about. Again, it was a centurion in the book of Acts that concerned Peter. You see, being a good soldier and being masculine goes together. It requires considerable masculinity. And yet, both examples in the New Testament were for men and towards men who were extremely masculine, both centurions. Now, this is an important part of the message, and it fits into it. Remember when I showed in one of the points that masculinity about group solidarity and I ask you to remember this keep this in mind Jules Henry in his book Culture Against Man he says this and I quote it because boys are united in flocks by the requirements of their games they are held together more tightly than girls and hence the competition among girls for friends is more intense than among boys now you ladies you think about it back as you were girls and you men think about it back as you were boys think about what I'm saying here now and gossip literally runs wild in these girls groups 
It is difficult for boys to avoid group life and teamwork. Girls indulge in semi-isolated play. Boys flock. Girls seldom get together in groups above four. Whereas for boys, a group of four is almost useless. Boys are dependent upon masculine solidarity within a relatively large group. In boys' groups, the emphasis is on masculine unity. In girls' cliques, the purpose is to shut out other girls. And ladies and gentlemen, I can see that our time is running out, and we're going to have to conclude with Pastor Earl Jones's message. If you'd like to have that entire message entitled, The Effeminized Male, write to us and request it by name. It's tape number 313 in our Scriptures for America tape catalog. And close an offering of $5 or more, and we'll send it to you. If you would like to have a parallel tape with it called Babylonian Castration by Pastor Peters, enclose an offering for it as well and request it by name. Our mailing address is Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Again, that's Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. As I was listening to this most informative message, I thought about the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, etc., etc., shall inherit the kingdom of God. Do you suppose the enemies of the kingdom of God know that truth, and thus they have been promoting homosexuality and the effeminization of the American male. Remember, we need your prayers and your financial support for this radio ministry. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you, and lift his countenance upon you, and grant you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to Scriptures for America Worldwide with Pastor Peter J. Peters. Should you want to write, the address is Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Our fax number is Country Code 01-307-745-5914. Again, that is Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535, USA. Fax number 01-307-745-5914. When writing, please let us know on which broadcast frequency you received this program. Scriptures for America Worldwide is an evangelical ministry dedicated to proclaiming the correct gospel of the kingdom of Christ and to revealing to the world the true scriptural identity of the true covenant people. The Bible says, quote, creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God, end quote. This ministry is supported by tithes and free will offerings. Please pray for Scriptures for America Worldwide. Are you tired of trying to find a church that's biblically correct? Are you frustrated with the foamy froth of the Pharisees' leaven? Then it's time to join DVD Church from Scriptures for America with Pastor Peter J. Peters and the LaPorte, Colorado Church of Christ. Experience powerful, straight-talk preaching in the privacy of your home. Enjoy 30 minutes of Sunday school, learn the basic fundamentals of victorious Christian living as Pastor Applegate teaches Christian Living 101. Then enter into praise and worship as cowboy singer Jim Lynch leads congregational singing. Our 60-minute morning worship service follows with Pastor Peter serving communion and then preaching powerful truth straight from the Bible. No politically correct mumbo-jumbo here, just the uncompromised Word of God. DVD Church is recorded live every Sunday morning. Watch it on your TV in your time of convenience. Your free DVD Church disc is sent the next day by First Class Mail. Order your free DVD Church disc today. Write to Scriptures for America. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pastor Peters. I hope you're enjoying listening to the Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network. People are listening to this network all around the world, and they're hearing verboten truth. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, through satellite, shortwave, regular radio, and Internet, all, I might say, without commercials or begging for funds. 
But I need to let you know that we need some funds to keep doing what we're doing. What we do do, we do through faith. We pray a lot. And I have prayed that some of you who have been receiving from us might begin to give some back to us. We ask that you would pray for us and that you would consider sending some financial support to Scriptures 4.11. 